Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Powering a Resilient Future, the kickoff for Energy Week 2022 and part of the Rubenstein Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Erin Curtin, and I'm one of the co-chairs for Energy Week this year. And I'm Anjali Balakrishna, uh, the other Energy Week co-chair. Over the past few months, Erin and I have had the distinct privilege of working with an incredible team of students from schools across Duke uh, to put together a week of programming aimed at promoting collaboration, knowledge sharing, networking among students, alumni, faculty and staff, industry professionals, and more, uh, who are interested in building a cleaner, more resilient, and more equitable energy system. When we started planning Energy Week, our primary goal was to design a week that was inclusive. I would bring people together who are already passionate about energy and those who aren't energy nerds quite yet. The climate crisis has inspired us and many of our peers to pursue a career in energy. We hope to use Energy Week this year to connect the dots between energy and climate change, and in doing so, create a platform from, for students from diverse backgrounds and programs of study to come together. That's why this year's theme is the Energy Climate Nexus. Tonight's keynote by Alice Hill, Powering a Resilient Future, will bring this theme to life as it explores how our energy systems and climate crisis are inextricably linked, and how it's possible to build a stronger, more resilient world by recognizing these connections. Energy Week just so happens to overlap with the start of COP27, where global leaders will gather in Egypt to make meaningful commitments and demonstrate progress towards uh, curbing the most devastating impacts of climate change. As we look around from the floods in Pakistan to hurricanes in Florida, we can see how high the stakes are, uh, particularly for communities that have been relegated into marginalized positions due to systems of inequity in the U.S. and around the world. Um, as we gather here at Duke this week, uh, we hope to create an environment that prioritizes justice and equity, um, that highlights promising solutions, not just heavy problems, uh, and engages our community to learn in ways that play to your strengths and interests. So to that end, uh, we're going to play a short video to get you all a little pumped up about Energy Week, which the booth is about to do right now. And there's still time to register for more. <laughs> we hope that video got you excited about tonight and the rest of the week. Now, before we get into the program, we want to thank a few of our partners who made Energy Week possible. A big thanks to Sanford and the Rubenstein Lecture Series for co-hosting tonight's event with us. Thank you to the Nicholas Institute and the Ed Schinner for your support and guidance throughout this process. And of course, to our sponsors at Platinum Level, NextEra Energy, at Lithium Level, AES and PWC, at Gold, Eight Rivers, Baywa, Chevron, and Schneider Electric. At Bronze, Southern California Edison, Apex Clean Energy, Exxon Mobil, and finally, Advanced Energy for your in-kind contribution. We want to thank our wonderful team of undergraduate and graduate students who have put together a fantastic week for you all. We are very grateful for our lineup of speakers, and we look forward to sharing these events with you. Okay, before, I know it's time to clap, but there's a couple more quick things. Um, so two other little housekeeping items. So first, you may have noticed this 
giant screen with Slido information. As soon as you hear Alice start talking, you're gonna wanna ask her a, a bunch of questions because she's brilliant. Um, and this is your way to do that. So uh, throughout the talk, um, please submit questions uh, using Slido. Uh, two of our all-star team members who are both undergrads and are amazing, Michael Wood and Emily Zhao, are gonna be moderating a Q&A with Alice after she gives her talk. And they'll be fielding those questions that you put in uh, the Slido, so do it. They're gonna be great, great questions. Um, and we also encourage you to list some social features. You can like the questions that you wanna see asked, so those pop to the top, so that, um, yeah, you get, have, get to have Alice answer the questions you'd like to hear her answer. Um, and then, not that this is the reason you are all here, but as you know, there is a reception after with food and drinks, um, and as you leave the theater, uh, you'll get your drink ticket, so make sure to look out for that. All right, so to kick us off, I'd like to invite Mark Julen to the stage to say a few words about the first Energy Week event that happened this morning, the Energy and Emerging Markets Case Competition. Mark will tell us a bit about the competition and share this year's winners. All right, good evening, everyone. It's great to see a good turnout here. Uh, my name is Mark Juland. I'm an associate professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy. And I also co-lead uh, the James E. Rogers Energy Access Project at Duke. Um, I'll call it EAP for short. Um, with Jonathan Phillips, who would be here, sends his regrets, but he's actually away in Egypt at COP. Um, so he sends his regrets. Uh, first launched in 2013, uh, this Energy and Emerging Markets competition um, introduces graduate students across the globe to real energy challenges affecting the developing world. Um, so very much relating to this idea of just energy transitions and making sure that the poorest on the planet still are going to be able to access clean and sustainable energy in the future. Uh, the competition provides a platform for students to propose unconventional business-based solutions with positive social and environmental impact. Um, and it's organized by the MBA Energy Club at Duke's Fuqua School of Business and is also co-sponsored by EAP. Um, we provide prize money to help incentivize the competition. Um, Jim Rogers, uh, who our pro project is named after, um, he was uh, formerly the CEO at Duke, um, and one of the first things that he did when he came to Duke as a Rubenstein scholar and fellow was uh, to get this competition off the ground. Um, so it started in 2013, it's now 10 years on, um, and it's really inc incredibly exciting to see what this competition has become. It's grown, um, there's lots of student energy around really interesting problems. Thousands of students from many schools across the globe have participated. This year alone, there were 75 teams that entered the competition and several hundred students associated with those teams from 11 different countries. Um, hopefully, many of you will continue to explore this space and continue to compete in developing new ideas like um, the ones that are a part of this competition. Um, indeed, finding private sector-led models for delivering sustainable and affordable energy access is really essential if we're going to deliver on SDG 7 and scale these solutions. That's what this competition was founded for, to try to develop such ideas and, and foster them. Um, this year, in particular, teams worked on developing a business model for a company named, called Nithio, um, and the idea was to develop an AI platform for clean energy solutions financing. One of the major challenges is financing these large capital investments moving forward. Um, a few thank yous before I announce the winners. Uh, so thanks uh, to Petya and Frankie who did incredible work here, kind of developing this case, working with Nithio, organizing the event. Also to the Nithio team that engaged in developing the case. That makes it a real problem for students to work on. Um, to the judges who uh, devoted their expertise and time to evaluating these various teams and bringing the competition to a successful end. And then finally, to all of the other organizers of Energy Week who helped embed this competition so seamlessly into what is a really exciting and ambitious program. Um, so a round of applause for all of those organizers. 
And so finally, to announce the winners, um, there were five finalist teams that made it to the final presentation stage. Um, two of those teams were from Duke, so we know Duke did well. Um, but uh, ultimately, the winner was uh, from the University of Cambridge. Um, and they're not present. They were uh, participating virtually. Uh, but uh, they won, and then the runner-up was from Presidio uh, Graduate School, which is in California. Um, and then third place was um, the Duke Fuqua team, um, one of the two Duke teams in the final five. Uh, so congratulations to those teams. And now I won't take any further time. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone uh, to Associate Dean for Academic Programs in the Sanford School, Corey Krupp. And she's going to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. Thanks. Well, good evening. Thank you, all of the Energy Week organizers and students and everyone else joining us tonight. We're thankful to partner with Energy Week uh, for this kickoff event. So welcome to the David M. Rubenstein Distinguished Lecture, featuring our distinguished guest this evening, Ms. Alice Hill, who's going to be talking about powering a resilient future. I'm Corey Krupp. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Student Affairs at the Sanford School of Public Policy. So the Rubenstein Lecture Series was created through the generosity of David Rubenstein. He was a graduate of the Trinity class of 1970. And he created this series with the mission of bringing the foremost voices in American public policy to Duke. If you're here in person or online, we're very happy that you've decided to spend this part of the evening with us. So public policy is essential to meet the greatest challenges the world faces. And one of our ambitions in the Sanford School is to inspire students to live lives of service and leadership. And we know this event, in particular, will give students and others who are interested in policy, especially energy and environmental policy, a lot to think about and a lot to inspire you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker tonight, Alice Hill, who is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council for Foreign Relations. Her work there focuses on the risks, consequences, and responses associated with climate change. She previously served as a special assistant to President Barack Obama, and she was Senior Director for Resilience Policy at the National Security Council staff. She also previously worked on climate adaptability, strategic planning for catastrophic events, including pandemics before we even had one, and anti-human traffic in in initiatives at the Department for Homeland Security. Her co-authored book, Building a Resilient Tomorrow, was pu published in 2019, and her most recent book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19, was just published in September of 2021. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Alice Hill to Duke University this evening for the Rubenstein Lecture and the kickoff of Energy Week. Well, what a pleasure. I want to say thank you for having me here. You know, the Sanford School of Public Policy is known for being a community of thinkers and doers. We just heard you're dedicated to leaving the world a better place. And that's exactly the group that we need right now here in the United States and across the globe. We desperately need to tackle this question, the topic of my talk today, powering a resilient future. It is a double honor to be giving the David M. Rubenstein lecture today. David Rubenstein's thoughtful philanthropy has supported not only his alma mater, Duke University, but also my professional home now, the Council on Foreign Relations. His insights on world affairs, and he just has a new book out on leadership, 
have informed policymakers for generations now. So it's truly an honor to be giving this lecture. As we've heard, yesterday witnessed another step in the long journey of addressing the threat of climate change. So, next slide. If there's one thing I ask you to take away from this lecture, let it be this. Virtually all of the infrastructure upon which people and communities rely, including the electric grid, was built to survive the climate of the past, not the climate that we're already experiencing or of the future. So don't be surprised when that infrastructure fails in the face of worsening impacts. Until we adapt that infrastructure to future climate extremes, energy systems will continue to collapse. And those failures will cascade through other critical infrastructure sectors. The United States has more than 10,000 power plants, close to 650,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines, and more than 6.3 million miles of distribution lines. And most of the electric grid is in the hands of for-profit utility companies. That grid is old and aging. The nation's power plants have an average age of over 30 years. So do you think they were planned for climate change? Do you think they were designed to operate in changing conditions? 70% of power transformers and transmission lines are a quarter century old or more. And the bulk of the nation's transmission system was built in the middle of the last century. That means when the designers and the engineers were looking at what do we need to plan for, how extreme could it get? They were looking at rainfall tables that could be 60 or 70 years old. Well, those rainfall tables have changed in the interim, and they're changing very rapidly right now. But we don't yet systematically include that knowledge of what's happening now as well as future risks in our planning, maintenance, operation of the electric grid. Components that we put in this system were only expected to last 50 years, and they are already beyond that in many instances. And because most of the grid exists above ground, it is particularly susceptible to these new worsening climate and weather extremes. So next slide. It should therefore come as no surprise that weather causes most power outages in the United States. On this slide from Climate Central, a really small but mighty nonprofit that informs meteorologists and tries to do public messaging just based on scientific knowledge about what's happening with climate. The pink line, or the, I guess the beige line, and this the way it comes up here, marks weather-related outages. The gray tracks other outages. So we're seeing an increase in weather-related outages. Climate worsened weather threatens all aspects of the grid. It challenges electricity generation, distribution, and transmission. And when the energy sector fails, it just pulls everything else down. Next slide, please. So almost exactly a decade ago, Hurricane Sandy. It's coming up uh, the coast and about to hit New York City. It showed us how the energy sector brings down other critical infrastructure sectors. The storm stretched over 1,000 miles in diameter. It directly affected 24 states. It impacted over 200 energy assets across the Northeast. And more than 8 million people went without power as the storm caused what was then the third largest blackout in US history up to that time. 
Landing during a full moon at high tide, Sandy quickly swamped flood barriers around Manhattan. As it turned out, lower Manhattan had suffered about a foot of sea level rise since 1900. And they'd built barriers assuming that the uh, storm surge, that's that wall of water that's pushed forward by uh, a big storm, it couldn't exceed, I think it was 11 feet, and Sandy came in to over 12. And so the barriers around Manhattan were quickly overcome by this huge wall of water. The barriers had not been improved. So when a electric substation in lower Manhattan flooded, the city that never sleeps plunged into darkness. Next slide. So that's a picture of Manhattan after Hurricane Sandy. And um, anyone know what the lit up building is? It's the headquarters of Goldman Sachs. Um, and um, Goldman Sachs, after 9-11, had decided, you know what, we didn't like what happened during 9-11, we're going to invest in resilience. So they had their own um, electric system, what, uh, so they could operate. But uh, the COO of Goldman Sachs was quoted just about this time saying, you know, the only problem was our employees couldn't get to work. And there are pictures of cars floating in front of this lighted building. So we can't make ourselves islands. We're going to have to figure out how all this works. But the water that came in flooded uh, tunnels under the East River. New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority had to rely on outside help to drain the floodwaters because the collapse of the electric grid knocked out the subway's pump system. Above ground, local residents learned that if there is no electricity, you can't pump gas. So people, even on the dry roads, had trouble getting around. Hospitals went dark. Turned out we'd put our generators in the basement, they flooded, or sometimes they put them up on the roof, which is a good idea, but they didn't have fuel that could get up to the roof to fire, to fire up the generators. Across New York City, medical personnel had to evacuate 6,500 patients from hospitals, some of them from intensive care. And by the way, they put the intensive care up high. So they're evacuating intensive care patients down darkened stairways, and their pictures, iconic pictures, of just handheld flashlights to help people get out from a skyscraper. Without power, outpatient centers closed, causing one of every four dialysis patients in New York to mistreatments. So huge effects on public health. And with the city's sewage infrastructure overwhelmed by the floodwaters, roughly 11 billion gallons of wastewater spilled into those waterways around New York. Next slide, please. So climate change at its simplest is a story of water. Too much water and too little water. But water is key to electrical production. As climate change brings higher temperatures and increased water scarcity and variability, production of power suffers. Now, I think a lot of these students here know this better than I do, but thermoelectric power plants generate much of the electricity in the United States using steam-driven turbine generators. That process requires water to cool equipment, making electricity production one of the largest users of water nationally and globally. And you'll find that many power plants are located right next to bodies of water because there's a huge amount of water that they can pull on. So there's a sea level rise risk there or riverine flooding risk, but also those waters are getting too warm. 
The U.S. Geological Service estimated that ther thermoelectric power accounted for over 40 percent of total water withdrawals in 2015. Hotter conditions affect the availability and the temperature of those cooling waters. Right now, inadequate water supplies to cool power plants threaten production of power in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Higher water temperatures have had marked impacts on the generation of nuclear power. You know, we'll hear a lot, and nuclear should be part of the solution. And sometimes we hear, let's just keep those nuclear power plants going longer. Whatever side you are on that debate, one important point is that that nuclear fleet is old. And it wasn't designed for a world with climate impacts. So if we decide to extend the life of a nuclear power plant, let's hope the owners and the operators have thought through what are the risks of running a nuclear plant, power plant in a world of changing conditions. Two-thirds of the existing nuclear global fleet was designed in the 1970s and 1980s with an expected service life of 30 to 40 years. So we need to think through what we're going to do. They were not built for climate-driven extremes. If the cooling waters upon which nuclear plants depend get too warm, as happened in Connecticut in the past and in France this summer, we lose that power. The plants should shut down for everyone's safety. A Stanford researcher has found that there were eight times the number of heat-related nuclear plant outages in the 2010s as compared with the 1990s. And rising sea levels, as we saw in Manhattan, puts those nuclear plants at risk as well. Next slide, please. In 2018, the congressionally mandated fourth national climate assessment concluded that climate change will increasingly threaten the U.S. energy supply. And we've already heard, transportation goes down without electricity, water treatment, wastewater treatment, communications, and healthcare delivery. Unfortunately, sound estimates of the costs of outages are lacking. Although the cost of repairing the grid can be determined, the cost to customers, the business interruption, the kids who don't get to school, the doctor appointments missed, go when power is down, is harder to calculate. And costs often disproportionately affect vulnerable populations like those dependent on electrical medical devices, the poor who don't have uh, adequate uh, access already, uh, the very young, the very old. So as the National Climate Assessment predicted, power outages are on the rise. This is a map of the states with ma major power outages since 2020. In 2022, an analysis by the Associated Press, which relied on data that the utilities actually submit themselves to the Department of Energy, concluded that outages occurred about 50 times a year in the early 2000s. But in the past five years, they've jumped to over 100. And we heard that extreme weather is one of the major sources of those outages. A separate study issued this year by Climate Central found that between 2000 and 2021, weather-related events caused over 80% of outages. And some of these blackouts, the extreme weather, bear the distinct fingerprints of climate change. Now, it used to be, when I started working on climate change, that I could never say that event was worsened by climate change. But scientists, who work in the field of attribution science can now tell us that particular event was worsened by climate change or it wouldn't have occurred at all absent climate change. So we have a lot better information now about what is going on. Next slide, please. So winter weather is a big one. That causes a lot of outages. Climate Central has estimated that from 2000 to 2021, Winter weather caused about 22% of major power outages. And what do these outages look like? 
Well, in winter, storms hit the Northeast, and in 2021, one such storm, they're called nor'easters, drove tree branches into power lines in New England. Approximately half a million businesses lost power. School closures and transportation shutdowns followed. In 2017, a winter storm left more than a third of Maine without power. Now, Maine is particularly challenged. Its electrical infrastructure has components, a lot of components, that are more than 50 years old. I think you all will recall that February 2021, when Texas plunged into darkness, a winter freeze triggered the worst energy infrastructure failure in Texas history. More than two out of three Texans, or 69% lost power. Several hundred people died, some in their beds of cold. Now, despite prior cold snaps and warnings from federal regulators, the state had failed to prepare its grid for winter extremes. Texas State Comptroller's Office pegged the losses from that event alone between 80 and $130 billion. Next slide, please. So in addition to winter storms, we've all seen a lot of examples of hurricane outages. Hurricanes cause widespread loss of power during the summer. Climate Central estimated that from 20, excuse me, 2000 to 2021, tropical storms and hurricanes caused about 15% of outages. Last year, Hurricane Ida heavily damaged transmission lines in Louisiana. A million people went without power, some for over two weeks during that event. Now again, much of the Louisiana transmission system is really old. It was built to a standard dating from the 1970s, long before most of the people in this room were born. And so it was planned for a climate that no longer exists. exists. It only anticipated that winds could reach a maximum of 95 miles per hour. So we're seeing higher wind speeds with more intense storms and those poles get knocked over. In that case, 31,000 poles were damaged. They collapsed under 150 mile per hour winds. This fall, Hurricane Ian left 2.6 million people in the dark and Hurricane Fiona knocked out 70% of the power in Puerto Rico. And without electricity, it's really unpleasant for those, there's no water to flush the toilet, there's no drinking water, there's no bathing water, there's no power to pump water. Next slide, please. As wildfire threats increase with higher temperatures, Utilities have been forced into action. They are preemptively cutting power in some instances. There's a reason why that definitely happens in California because there's essentially a law that finds power utility companies liable for almost all the damage they cause if there's a fire resulting from a downed power line, for example. And if there are strong winds and dry conditions, companies shut down transmission for fear that a falling branch or downed wire is going to spark a wildfire. And this loss of electricity sometimes comes on a very hot day just when customers need it most. Next slide, please. Drought undermines the production of hydropower. Lake Mead, the largest human-made reservoir, is at the lowest point since the Hoover Dam was constructed. And declining water flows have cut power generation by almost 50%. This summer, California, which might have relied on importation of power from the Pacific Northwest, couldn't get that power because the Pacific Northwest had their own drought. And they had reduced the production of power for them, so they didn't have power to share. Heat waves can also cha challenge electrical transmission. In 2021, the Pacific Northwest suffered a prolonged heat wave 
that melted power cables and caused transmission lines to sag. And in 2020, a heat wave drove Californians to crank up their air conditioning. The surge in power caused the utilities to say, we can't handle this load. We got to shut down in some areas. Next slide, please. So California has invested deeply in solar power, a clean source, uh, and that is to be commended. That addresses the mitigation side. But sometimes these two sides of the climate coin collide. And that happens when you have wildfires and solar power. Clean energy may not perform as well with changing climatic conditions. So when wildfires, that smoke and soot, prevent sunlight from reaching the panels, solar production drops. Australia has the same thing. California has seen significant drops in power as a result of wildfires. During two weeks in September 2020, wildfires reduced solar power production by 13% in California. And all of these cuts, I've listed so many of them. You think down, drill down, who are they affecting? They're affecting people's lives. It might be just the stuff in the refrigerator is damaged. It might be somebody who's really suffering in a sweltering home and is at much greater risk of heat stroke. Or it may be a darkened classroom and kids just missing school. The international consulting firm ICF estimates that US electric utilities will need to spend approximately $500 billion to build resilience. Next slide, please. So how do we get to grid resilience? We focus so much on clean energy, but how do we make sure that the grid operates as well under changing conditions? We're all dependent on this power. We all have devices. Everything's connected. It's the digital age, and we need reliable power. But in the United States, no entity, no single entity in America bears sole responsibility or authority for building grid resilience across the board. The federal government, however, has an important role in promoting resilience. And in my opinion, there are three essential steps that will jumpstart resilience in the energy sector. The first, and it isn't sexy, is to plan to achieve resilience. The federal government should develop a national energy resilience plan. That seems like such a basic step, but it's a step we need to take. The national energy plan should identify needed actions across all levels of government. The grid is not in the hands of the federal government for the most part, but we need to work across all levels of government, the private sector and communities to improve resilience. The goal, of course, is to reduce power outages and ensure rapid restoration when they do occur. Now, to do this, we need to figure out what are the potential failure points in the grid. If only one power line, for example, serves a community, that could be a problem if that power line goes down. And any plan must account for how failures of the electric grid just act like an anchor in drawing down the rest of the infrastructure sectors with it, as we saw with New York City. A national plan should also recognize that intentional investment in risk reduction, in building resilience to future climate risks, saves money. We know from national studies that every $1 spent on reduction of risk before the bad event can save $6 or more in recovery costs. Utilities need to also develop resilience plan. The Department of Energy has recommended that. And so has the ratings agency Moody's. Surprisingly, many utilities have not yet embarked on these efforts in a comprehensive way, according to research by the Environmental Defense Fund. 
And all too often, utilities have continued to look to historical data, what happened in the past, to assess their risks. But climate change requires a fundamentally different approach. We have to be informed by climate modeling or some other scenarios to make reasonable judgments about how to improve the reliability in a warmer world. So what we find is that the utilities that are planning are looking at historical data, not so much what's already happening, and certainly not very much at all about the future. And utility planning could drive focus on ways to speed the recovery of energy in the wake of disaster by, for example, bolstering supply chains and stockpiles. Certainly some, a lesson that anyone has taken out of the pandemic is we need to make sure that our supply chains remain strong, fortify them, and in some instances have adequate stockpiles. But we're seeing a huge drain, probably because we're having all these outages, on the lead time to procure distribution transformers. That lead time leapt from two to three months to a year between 2020 and 2022. So to protect against all of these threats, we need to look to the future. That means that when it's flooding, substations may have to be elevated, control rooms and pump stations protected, and additional flood protections added. To protect against loss of hydropower, we have to look at other sources of energy to build up what we have. Increased water efficiency for cooling systems and thermoelectric plants could build resilience. Bearing power lines and replacing wooden poles with concrete poles would also reduce outages. Next slide, please. And then we need to focus on marrying mitigation and adaptation. We can't treat these as separate things. We've already heard about the solar panels not doing as well in wildfire, a climate worsened condition. So here, California said, okay, we could do, achieve both things at once if we put solar panels on our canals. A lot of water flows through from uh, the north to south and elsewhere on, along canals in California. A lot of loss of water through evaporation. So California said, let's try putting our solar panels over those canals, less water lost, and we're also in, not taking away from land mass for solar power. Energy efficiency and conservation can also help build resilience and cut the greenhouse gas pollution. During a brutal heat wave this summer, California avoided rolling blackouts simply by using our digital technology, texting residents to say, you know, if you cut down on your use of power during these evening hours when we have the greatest demand, we can avoid rolling blackouts. We need to start thinking about that. Are we looking at resilience in our adaptation, excuse me, in our operations, our maintenance, and our planning for these systems? And last, and that's where I think all of you here can play a very important role, is innovate. We need to innovate so desperately in this area. Next slide, please. So uh, we can have distributed solar power. Uh, it will help keep the lights on. You know, when Hurricane Fiona swept over Puerto Rico this year, over a million people lost power. Now, during Hurricane Maria in 2017, uh, the territory suffered the second largest blackout in U.S. history. So uh, uh, Fiona hits this year, turns out, there's been a great investment in solar rooftop solar panels. And that had a measurable difference. Those panels often had battery packs installed, and those homes were able to continue 
to generate power and get through even though the rest of the island was dark. Similarly, uh, right here in North Carolina, Hurricane Florence in 2018, residents who had solar power suffered only minor disruptions, but those powered from more traditional fossil fuel sources went without electricity for much longer. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory estimates that solar panels have just a 0.05% failure rate for reliability. Next slide, please. Now, we can't build everything new. In fact, we only turn over buildings, housing stock, somewhere between 5 and 10%, uh, really 5% every year. So we're, we're talking about a lot of retrofitting here for what we want to accomplish. But this is an example of a new investment. This is Babcock Ranch. You might have heard about it in relation to Hurricane Ian. When Hurricane Ian swept through Florida, this community's investment in resilience and green energy paid huge dividends. It's a planned community. The developers of Badcock Ranch chose land purposely that was higher. It was elevated from storm surge. It's about 12 miles from the coast, but they wanted to make sure that they were very protected. They built everything to strict building codes, so codes that could handle the higher wind speeds that come from more intense storms. They raised the wastewater treatment plants and utility plants to avoid flooding. They buried the power lines wherever possible, and where that was not possible, the developers used concrete poles. The developers also set the goal of becoming the first solar-powered town in the United States, building an 870-acre solar farm. The development never lost power during Hurricane Ian or internet, even though we saw that much of the rest of the Florida, good portion of it, plunged into darkness. After Hurricane Sandy, New York City's local utility, Con Edison, sought to raise electricity prices. And a really enterprising group of lawyers said, wait a minute, you're going to raise prices and we just had this huge storm? Well, as a condition of raising prices, you should be investing in resilience. And they intervened in the Public Utility Commission efforts and Con Edison and this is not new, this is retrofitting, agreed to spend a billion dollars on bearing lines and other actions. Next slide, please. Microgrid. This is during Sandbrook University disconnected from the main grid so it could provide reliable power. Expanded battery storage can provide more power. Told you about Puerto Rico. 50,000 homes that now have rooftop solar and backed up to a battery system, huge difference. And just last week, plans to produce Puerto Rico's first virtual power plant were announced. The virtual power plant will use the existing network, that's 50,000 homes, and battery systems to allow those who don't have direct access to solar power to tap in. And you may know that the energy grid in Puerto Rico is severely challenged. So this could may be a really significant enhancer to the quality of life of many Puerto Ricans. Other ideas include closed loop water cooling systems to conserve water, greater use of sensors and other smart grid technologies to pinpoint the outage, not waiting for somebody to call it in, which where I live, that's what we do. We just call it in when it goes out. But if we had the Internet of Things, we could go have people out right away. And by the way, we could also have AI telling us what are the likely failure points in your grid, and let's shore up those, because if that piece of structure or piece of the grid goes out, it has dire consequences for everybody else. As we know, the sooner the problem is identified, the faster power can be restored. Next slide, please. So my question for each of you is what can you do? 
I've described some big challenges. The stakes here are not minor. This isn't just about financial loss, although that's significant enough. It's about saving lives, preventing misery, and preserving the quality of life. The good news is that this is doable. Now we have the Inflation Reduction Act that will jumpstart efforts for cleaner energy. And as new energy systems are deployed, let's just make sure that the planners also make sure that they're resilient systems. By hosting this Energy Week and the stellar group of students that have planned it, Duke continues to demonstrate that it already recognizes the problem and it's already, through its competition, identified solutions. Its graduates can very much be a part of finding our way. With that said, we should be all be aware that climate change waits for no one. There's no quiet quitting. There's no hot hitting pause. It's going to require the innovation and drive of Duke graduates and graduates across the country and the globe for years to come. This is one of the greatest opportunities in human history to make positive change. And I'll just share that, you know, I used to be a judge. And when I was a judge, I'd suggest something to the lawyers and they'd say, oh no, judge, can't do that. We've already tried that. No, nope, the law says you can't do that. Nope, that's closed to us. That's not true here. That's one of the things I love about working on this issue is we don't have all the answers. We need great minds figuring out how and when and where we will accomplish what we need to accomplish. So for those of you in the audience, I urge you to learn as much as you can about energy, the environment, climate change, and both sides of climate change, resilience and mitigation. And now, if we don't make progress on mitigation, we'll probably have a third side, geoengineering. But we're gonna put that aside for a moment. The next decade will witness an explosion of jobs in clean energy and resilience. I'm already seeing that. I mean, there's an arms race among consultancies, modeling firms, finance firms. Microsoft just announced they can't get enough sustainability graduates. So people with knowledge are gonna be in demand. A whole host of occupations, and it could be from artist to scientist, engineer to lawyer, and especially policy experts and engineers and science experts. Everyone will be very much in demand to meet this really enormous challenge, the challenge of our time and the future. And my hope is that in all of these efforts, you incorporate the essential lesson. Prepare for the conditions of the future, not of the past. So thank you so much for having me here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill, for your motivating and incredibly illuminating speech on climate resilience and what we can do for the future. My name is Emily Zhao, and I'm an undergraduate junior studying environmental science and policy and statistics, and I'll be co-moderating this quick Q&A. Thanks, Emily. I'm Michael, and I'm a senior studying mechanical engineering, and very looking forward to hearing your answers to some of these questions. We've already got a bunch pouring in. Uh, I've been working with Emily and the rest of the Energy Week team to help plan some of the events that we're going to see all of y'all at over the next few days, so really excited for this week to kick off. I'm just delighted to be here. What an honor. All right. 
Well, let's start off with the first question. We're going to make this a lightning round. We'll try to get through as many of these as possible. So the first one we've got with a whopping 11 upvotes. Um, <laughs> historic emissions from rich nations drive climate impacts across the globe. What can citizens of these countries, like many of us in this room, do about it? Oh, the citizens of the rich countries? Well, we can all look at our uh, carbon footprint to start. You know, I think it's uh, the 1% of the richest people in the world cause something, I've forgotten the figure, but well over 50% of the emissions. So we live a very emission-rich life uh, as Americans. So we can start there. But I don't think it's just our individual actions that will change things. It's also, we need to prioritize this as a policy. It's difficult to do. I can tell you, uh, one of the things, I had the honor of working in the White House, and one of the things that uh, was very clear to me, that in that kind of policy environment, the urgent overtakes the important. Now, I've just said climate change is urgent, but it's perceived as important and not immediate. It's not like the crisis of the day that you need to solve right now. And so we tend to kick this down the road. We are having the 27th COP, and uh, we haven't succeeded as we had hoped. So immediately, what can we all do? We can vote. We can prioritize this as an important issue that needs to be addressed. And in a democracy, how do we do that? We do it through voting. And then we can talk about it. The polling shows that we just don't talk about climate change. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. People tend to avoid the discussions. And the polling shows that we assume that our neighbor doesn't share concerns about climate change, that they discount climate change. And that's not so true. But we need to make it a topic that is safe and then call on all of us, what can we do better to achieve this? It is a global common, it's a, a tragedy of the commons, it's a global issue, but it, each, it comes down to each of us, what we can do personally, how we can influence others, and then, for those of you in the room, what can you do professionally to make a difference here? It needs everyone. It's an all-hands-on-deck problem. It's not going to disappear on its own, but it will crowd out. My fear is that if we don't address the resilience side of climate change, we are going to crowd out the very important work of mitigation because these damages from climate-worsened events are escalating. You can look at uh, any chart on the billion dollar events, and they're just escalating. So three prong, it's basically all of us need to engage. It, we can't sit back and think it's somebody else's problem, and you figure out in your own life how you can engage and start influencing others to care as we hope they would care, because we're all in this together. Definitely, and I think everybody in the audience is now very motivated to do their own individual action, but you did mention that this is also a problem, like a tragedy of the commons, and we can't tackle the climate crisis without massive public approval and a willingness to change. So what makes you confident that we can accomplish this necessary shift? Well, as they say uh, in the law, assumes facts, not in evidence. I mean, I can't tell you I think that we're going to do this necessarily. I think we all need to work hard on it. And uh, we've heard um, the head of the UN's saying we're headed towards a tragic future. One of the things that I think is not appreciated is, uh, and I shared this earlier with students, but is how humans may not be set up in our brains for the kinds of decision making that's involved with climate change. Um, we have to resort to uh, biases in our decision making, sort of these default decision making. And I, I was a judge. Your job description as a judge is to make decisions. Uh, 
So I got very interested in how do humans reach decisions and how could we be influenced by other factors? And I learned that there are a lot of defaults we rely on. One of them is optimism. So yes, I'm optimistic we can do a lot and we should do a lot, but I don't think anyone should think if we don't do a lot, this is just gonna take care of itself. It's gonna require everyone pulling oars and it's gonna require uh, the United States stepping up, it's gonna require China stepping up, India stepping up. Uh, basically, the G20 is about to meet. G20, the largest economies in the world, 20 largest economies, causes 80% of the emissions. If they all agreed to act, we could do something. But it's going to take everyone. So optimism is a problem. And then uh, we tend to discount the stories or, or the projections about what could occur. And it was... Uh, the chief risk officer of a major reinsurance company reinsures insure insurance companies, and the reinsurers are um, very much on top of climate change because they're looking at global risk around the world. And they basically, he said, you know, I think a problem is really our ability to assess catastrophic risk. We tend to judge risk based on what we or our friends have experienced. So you'll see in the reporting of Florida or anywhere, oh, I've never experienced, I've lived here 25 years, nothing like this has ever happened. Okay, but with climate change, the scientists have told us the worst is coming. And you'll also see in the reporting, watch for sometimes, it's like, oh, Hurricane Ian will be the worst it's ever going to be. That is not the case, but that's the way our minds think, and we have to overcome that. And that means... We need to plan, we need to have some barriers that we plan against, and we need to force ourselves to understand what the science is telling us and recognize that we may have some heuristics, some decision-making shortcuts that cause us to misjudge the risk. Yeah, and speaking of that planning, you addressed a number of potential solutions to address resiliency, and one of them was distributed energy resources. But that's not always easy, especially with local utilities pushing back. So we've got a question here on how can people, and especially regulators, fight back on rooftop solar and other distributed energy when utilities are fighting that? Well, this is where I think federal policy could help. I think if we had a national plan that this is a goal, and then we started giving incentives um, for it to occur, and uh, greater guidance on how we're going to work with the public utility commissions, making sure that the members of those commissions understand it's, what's at stake. Basically, we have a problem, in my opinion, that has developed. We've been working very hard on the clean energy side, but, it, but as we've been working on the clean energy side, the impacts have begun to materialize. And we don't have the workforce or the people, decision makers necessarily, who've been fully educated on climate change. If somebody went to school in the 70s, 80s, unless they were in environmental sciences, unlikely they have any formal education on climate change. And those are a lot of your decision makers in a lot of these places. So how are we gonna help them? I didn't have any education in this. I was given an assignment and I've worked you know, over a dozen years now in the field, but we need to figure out ways to educate them to understand what's at stake. Obviously, it's hard. Uh, we're, we have this, you know, they're winners and losers. And we're going to have to address that loss. We also, by the way, heuristically, we overvalue loss compared to gains. We tend to say, I don't want to lose this. We don't value the gain. So we need to help those who are the losers to figure out how they're also going to be gained, and then maybe even help them gain so that we can get over this challenge of not being able to accomplish the greater resiliency that we need to accomplish. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for sharing your insights and answering some of these questions. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to wrap up the Q&A there, but I'm sure if you have a burning question, Dr. Hill will be at the reception after this. And she also joined me on the Energy Terminal podcast this morning. So check that out and hopefully answer any questions that we didn't get to. And with that, I think we'll move on to welcoming Associate Dean Krupp back onto stage.
Well, I was so happy to hear there's so much economics in all this. I'm an econ professor, too. Um, behavioral economics, cost-benefit analysis, you guys all need to be heavily trained in these things. On behalf of the Sanford School of Public Policy, I thank you for being here tonight, for joining us for the Rubenstein Lecture Series and for the kickoff of Energy Week. I hope you'll attend more of these events this week. Um, I'm excited to see all of you here and that you're motivated to work on some of these huge challenges. I invite all of you who are here in person to join us um, at the reception. It's one floor above us. There will be students helping direct you and the drink tickets, all important. Please join me in thanking Alice Hill and all of the Energy Week students for this fantastic evening. So just two more things. You're going to be getting an evaluation form for tonight's event in email. We'd appreciate it if you'd give us your feedback. And if you want to learn more about the Sanford School, sanford.duke.edu. Enjoy your evening. Thanks for coming.